In this video, we'll be going through the multiple choice questions from the 2019 Mathematics Extension 1 HSE exam. Question 1. What is the domain of the function f of x equals log of 4 minus x? Well, we know that when we have log of some function, let's call it g of x, we know that the domain has to be g of x is strictly greater than 0 because it can't be equal to 0 and it can't be negative. So that means in this case we have 4 minus x is greater than 0. Rearranging gives us x is less than 4. So a is the correct answer. Question 2. From the point p outside a circle, a secant and a tangent to the circle are constructed as shown in the diagram. Which equation is satisfied by x? Okay, for this question, let's just label these points a, b, and c. And then this is a straight application of a circle geo theorem. So that theorem tells us that ap squared equals bp times cp. So that means we have 2x all squared equals x times cp, which is 9 plus x. So that means 4x squared equals x into 9 plus x. And that is our equation. So that means d is our correct answer. Question 3. What is the derivative of inverse tan of x on 2? Okay, so when we want to differentiate inverse tan of some function, whatever that function might be, it's going to be 1 over 1 plus... Now, if it's just x, it would be x squared. But because it's f of x, it becomes f of x squared. But then we also have to use the chain rule and multiply by the derivative of f of x. So in our case, we're differentiating inverse tan of x on 2. So that's going to be 1 over 1 plus our function, which is x on 2, our inside function, squared, times by the inside derivative. Well, what's the derivative of x over 2? With respect to x, it's a half. So if I multiply the top and the bottom by 4, I'm doing this all in one step, it's going to give us, let's see, we're going to get 2 over 4 plus x squared. So that means our answer should be c. The diagram shows the graph of y equals f of x. Which equation best describes the graph? Okay, so things that we can notice about this graph here. The first thing I notice straight away is that f of x is even. So let's write that down here. And that's going to be, I think, helpful because that's going to eliminate options a and option c. Because this is an odd function, x is odd over x squared minus 1 is even which means that the overall function is odd. The same thing here, odd over even, which makes it odd. So that's why we can eliminate A and C. The difference between B and D is just a minus sign. So if we have a look back in our function, we can see that when X gets larger and larger, so as X approaches infinity, what's happening to our function? Y is approaching positive 1, and it's approaching positive 1 from above as well. So that's going to eliminate option D, because as x approaches infinity, y is going to approach negative 1. And so that leaves us with B as our correct answer. Question 5. A particle starts from rest, 2 meters to the right of the origin, and moves along the x-axis in simple harmonic motion with a period of 2 seconds. Which equation could represent the motion of the particle? Okay, this is a good question. Things to note, the particle starts from rest, so let's highlight that, and it's two meters to the right of the origin. Okay, and it has a period of two seconds. So a period of two seconds means t is equal to two. Now, what do we know? We know that t is equal to two pi on n, which means that n is equal to 2 pi on t. And since t is equal to 2, that means we have 2 pi on 2, which equals pi. So that's going to eliminate options b and d. How do we differentiate between a and c? That's where the first bit of information comes in. A particle starts from rest, 2 meters to the right of the origin. Now we know in simple harmonic motion that a particle is at rest only at the extremities. 
so on the right extremity and on the left extremity. So that means two meters to the right of the origin is an extreme point, which means that in this case, in case C, it's telling us that, well, this bit here tells us that the point x equals 2 is actually the center of the, of the motion. But that's not correct because we've just said that x equals 2 is an extreme point, which means we can eliminate option C, and that means A is our correct answer. Question 6. It is given that sine x equals 1 on 4, where x is between pi on 2 and pi. What is the value of sine 2x? Okay, so sine 2x, well, we're given the value of sine x and we want to find sine 2x. Well, what is sine 2x? Well, we know our double angle formulas tell us that it's 2 times sine x times cos x. Now we need to work out what the value of cos x is because we already know what sine x is. To do that, we're actually going to draw a triangle. So let's draw this triangle here. This is the angle x. If that's angle x, then sine is opposite over hypotenuse, which is 1 on 4. And if we use Pythagoras' theorem, that will give us root 15 for this side length. Now we want to find cos x. So in this case, cos x is going to be, well, it's adjacent over opposite, so it's root 15 over 4. However, we need to be a little bit careful because we're told that we have a restriction on our values for x. X is in the second quadrant. It's between 90 and 180, which means that cos x in the second quadrant is negative. We can't forget that. I'm going to highlight that negative sign because it's very important. It's pretty much what they're looking for, I think, in this question. So sine, sine 2x is going to be 2 times sine x, which is 1 on 4, times cos x, which is negative root 15 on 4. So that's going to be negative root 15 on 8, which is option B. Question 7. Let P of x equal qx cubed plus rx squared plus rx plus q, where q and r are constants and q is not 0. One of the zeros of P of x is negative 1. Given that alpha is a zero of P of x, and alpha is not equal to negative 1, which of the following is also a zero? So here we have a polynomial of degree 3, and we know that negative 1 is a root, we know that alpha is a root, and we're trying to find the other root of the, of the polynomial. So let's call that root beta. Now we want to find what beta is in terms of, it seems when we look at the answers, in terms of alpha. So what are we going to do to, to, to get this? Well, we're going to look at our relationships between the sums and products of the roots and the coefficients of the polynomial. And if we look at the product of the roots, that's probably the way to go. So if we multiply all our roots together, by the way, this capital pi, this symbol is capital pi, and it means the product of roots, just like a capital sigma means the sum of roots. So we have negative one times alpha times beta, and that's equal to Let's see, it's going to be minus plus minus. So minus q divided by the coefficient of x cubed, which is also q. So we have negative alpha beta equals negative 1, which means beta equals 1 on alpha. And so therefore our answer is c. Question 8. In how many ways can all the letters of the word parallel be placed in a line with the three L's together? So how many letters are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight total letters. However, when we group the L's together, that would be considered as one sort of element. So we ha let's count the, the number of elements here. We have P, which is one, two, three, four, five, and then all the L's make one element. So altogether, that would become six. So we have six total elements. So how many ways can we arrange those six elements? Well, we can arrange them in six factorial ways. However, we have two A's. So A is a repeated element. So we can say here that we have two A's, which means that we have to divide by two factorial, which means A is our answer here. Question nine. Which graph best represents y equals the inverse cos of negative sine x, 
for x in between minus pi on 2 and positive pi on 2. Now this question can be done in a couple of ways. But the way I'm going to do it is by looking at this function and thinking about how I can try to simplify that function. Now we have an inverse cos, and if what was inside of our inverse cos, if the argument of the inverse cos was a cos function itself, then those two would cancel out, and we'd just be left with something much simpler. However, that's not what we have in this case. We have a negative sign inside our brackets. But if we can rewrite negative sign as a cos of something, then we'd actually be able to do that cancellation because the inverse function or the inverse cos and the cos would sort of undo each other. So the trick with this question is to recognize that negative sine x can be written as cos of x plus pi on 2. Now there's a few ways that you can convince yourself of this or prove it to yourself. You could draw the graph of both negative sine x and cos of x plus pi on 2 and you'll see that they're the same graph. Or you could also expand the right hand side and then see that you get negative sine x. So I'll leave that for you to do, but this is a true statement. Minus sine x is equal to cos of x plus pi on 2. So why is that helpful for us? Well, because now we've written the inside function as a cos of something. And so we have y equals the inverse cos of cos of x plus pi on 2. And then that's going to cancel out the inverse cos and the cos, and we're just left with x plus pi on 2. And then that's obviously a straight line with an x-intercept, sorry, with a y-intercept of pi on 2, and a gradient of 1, and that is option D. Question 10. The function f of x equals minus the square root of 1 plus the square root of 1 plus x has some inverse function, f to the negative 1x. The graph of y equals f to the negative 1x forms part of the curve y equals x to the 4 minus 2x squared. The diagram shows the curve y equals x to the 4 minus 2x squared. How many points do the graphs of y equals f of x and y equals the inverse f of x have in common? And the options are 1, 2, 3, or 4. Now, we've already got the curve for the inverse function, although it only makes up part of this curve, but we've got that curve. Let's start looking at f of x, and let's investigate how it's, how it's going to look. So the first thing I would do is consider the domain of f. Now, it should be clear that x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1, because obviously we can't have the square root of a negative number. So we have to have 1 plus x being greater than 1. Uh, sorry, being greater than 0. So this is our domain, which means that our first point in our graph, or our graph starts at x equals negative 1. So when x is equal to negative 1, what is f of x going to be, or f of negative 1, that's going to be, well, that's going to become negative 1 as well. So that means that this point, negative 1, comma negative 1, lies on f of x, or you can sort of think of it as the start of f of x. So let's actually mark that in our graph here. So negative 1, negative 1 is going to be sitting here. Now what else can we say about this graph? Well, let's start having a look at a few points. What happens when I go to x equals 0? We get f of 0 becomes negative root 2. What about when x equals 1? We get f of 1 equals negative the square root of 1 plus root 2. And what's happening is each time I go up by 1 in x, my f of x value is actually decreasing. It's getting larger, but it's becoming more negative, which means it's decreasing. And it should be clear that this is going to continue happening forever. It's never going to turn back. And so this is what we call monotonic decreasing. So we can say that f of x is monotonic decreasing. In other words, it's always getting smaller. So that means, what does that mean on our graph? Well, it means our graph is going to turn like this. It's going to start and it's going to go down and it's never going to come back up, which means it's never going to hit this graph again. And so there's only one point where it hits the graph. And so therefore, there's only going to be one point of intersection or one common point between F and its inverse. And so A is our answer.